Today on Christian World News, Benedict XVI goes into retirement. Thousands gathered to wish this popular pope farewell. Plus, unknown, unwanted, and unloved. Millions of children without parents struggle to survive. But now the church in one European nation is leading the effort to save orphans. And this Indian woman prayed to the Hindu gods her whole life, but she never knew peace until she got an answer she didn't expect. Pope Benedict bids farewell to the faithful. Hello everyone, I'm George Thomas. Tens of thousands gathered in the papal square on the eve of his historic resignation this week. The 85-year-old pontiff used his last message to remind Catholics around the world to stay faithful to God's word. Mark Martin has a story. He was surrounded by tens of thousands of the faithful. Many pressing in to catch a glimpse of their spiritual leader as he drove by on his Pope mobile. This is such a monumental time. No Pope has resigned the way he has done. And it, you know, it's something that we have to see. And then he took the stage, smiling, taking it all in. The crowds responding with long standing ovations. It was in many ways Pope Benedict's moment to reminisce one last time. When on April 19th, almost eight years ago, I accepted to take on the ministry of Peter, I had the firm certainty, which has always stayed with me, of the life of the church coming from God's word. 50,000 plus people turned out from around the world, waving flags and carrying banners saying thank you. The 85 year old pontiff resigns as leader of the world's 1.2 billion Catholics. He thanked his cardinals for their support and for honoring his decision to become the first pope in 600 years to resign. Loving the church also means to have the courage to make difficult and arduous choices, having always in front of us the good of the church and not ourselves. Speculation has been rife over what prompted the pope to resign suddenly. The church has faced multiple scandals over sexual abuse by priests. I think just the kind of weight of the job on someone uh, who is, you know, relatively frail uh, and very old, uh, you know, just took its toll and it was time for him to go. Yet Benedict spoke of carrying a heavy burden during his tenure. The words that resonated in my heart have been, Lord, why are you asking me? It is a great burden that you have placed on my shoulders, but if you ask me, I will accept, certain that you will guide me, even with all the weaknesses I have. Promising never to abandon the message of the cross, Benedict will become Pope Emeritus. He'll still wear his distinctive white cassock, minus his trademark red shoes. The College of Cardinals will meet this month to select a new pope. The pope will spend some time at a papal retreat before returning to the Vatican to live in a convent. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Turning to the Middle East, where about 100 Coptic Christians have been detained in Libya. The Egyptian news site Ahram Online reports the men are accused of spreading the gospel. A, co a Coptic source says the Christians are Egyptians working in Libya who were taken captive when extremist Muslims raided their church in Benghazi. The men reportedly have been tortured. The Coptic archbishop responsible for Libya said it doesn't make sense that so many Coptic Christians decide, decided to proselytize in another country. Egyptian authorities are working with the Libyans to resolve this situation. Syria's 2,000-year-old Christian community is being devastated by the civil war there. A Swedish journalist interviewed more than 100 Syrian Christian refugees in Turkey and Lebanon. They say Muslim rebel militia are driving them out because of their faith. One woman said her husband and son were shot in the head just because they were Christians. Syria's 2, point million, uh, 2 million rather Christian population is the second largest in the Middle East after Egypt. Today, whole villages disappear when Islamist rebels arrive. Every week, hundreds of Syrian Christians arrive in Lebanon. A Lebanese patriarch says it is a, quote, great exodus taking place in silence. Recently, CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell spoke with author Leela Gilbert about persecution of Christians in Syria and the Middle East on his Jerusalem Dateline program. What's the situation in Syria right now, specifically for Christians? It's very hard to tell right now. The problem is that the rebels are saying that the 
Assad uh, government is killing the Christians and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And nobody really can tell. They're fleeing and they are very much caught in the crossfire. Churches have been destroyed and there are terrible reports coming out, but it's hard to sift through them at this mm -hmm. time. You know, Syria is sort of the latest example of what's happening in the Arab Spring. What impact has the Arab Spring had on Christians in the Middle East? Well, what it's done, it's, it's overthrown strongmen like Mubarak and at soon probably Assad, who actually kept a tight rein against Islamist terrorism, and against Islamist mm -hmm generally abusing groups, minorities. Uh, but what's happening now is that in Egypt, the Islamists are now in charge. Uh, the government is implicitly involved and, and perhaps more. Their churches, you say, are attacked. Uh, for I think some sometimes uh, young women, Christian women, are kidnapped, aren't oh, they? Oh yeah, there, there's terrible stuff going on with Christian women, rape and, and kidnapping and forced marriages. There are, uh, villages are invaded and burned because of rumor of someone having an affair, a Muslim man with a Christian woman, honor is at stake. This just happened a few months ago in Egypt. And it's not just Egypt, it's happening in North Africa as well. And of course, as we've seen, Syria is a mess. Iraq has been devastated by this. Sometimes it's state-sponsored terrorism as it is our state-sponsored abuse of Christians, I should say. But uh, it's also uh, mobs and vigilantes that are not suppressed by governments in other places. So, And you say in your book that this has happened before. This is a phenomenon that that's, it's historical and it's happened uh, several decades ago. Well, that's true. The, uh, the slogan, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people, has to do with the Jews and the Christians. And the saying means that they will remove the Jews from their countries and then they will remove the Christians. And the Jews are gone. Essentially, 850,000 Jews uh, were kicked out of Arab lands, Muslim lands, mm -hmm. between 1948 and 1970. And they're almost, I think they're less than 8,000 now, and all of them put together except for Iran. Mm -hmm. But now we have the same phenomenon. We do have a voice that we can use legislatively. We can go to our congressmen and say, look, somebody's on death row in Iran. We need to get, mm -hmm. we need to intervene. And sometimes it works. Great. Leela, thanks for joining us. And you can see more of Chris's interview with Leela as well as fresh reports from Israel and the Middle East on his Jerusalem Dateline program. Find the link at rcbnnews.com. Coming up, seeking solutions to Ukraine's orphan epidemic. How Christians are taking dramatic action to see every orphan in the country adopted by a family. That story when we come back. CWnews.org. Your constant news source on the World Wide Web. Find daily updates on the global church. Watch the weekly broadcast. Three former presidents come together to honor the life and ministry. Also available in podcast. The in-depth insights into our reporter blogs. Taliban kidnapped at least 18 in South Korean Christians. Your Christians. online news source for complete coverage of the global church. It's a question each one of us must face. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Where will you spend eternity? In Gordon Robertson's newest DVD, Life Beyond the Grave, Part 2, you'll meet real people who have died and experienced heaven or hell. See their personal eyewitness accounts of what happens when we die. There's more love than you can imagine. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. In Life Beyond the Grave, Part 2, you'll discover a powerful tool to share the gospel with those you love what the Bible says about eternal life, and how you can know for certain that heaven is your destiny. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this sensation of being home. You can have the assurance that when you die and are absent from your body, you'll be present with Jesus for all eternity. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Your giving makes it all possible. Call and join the 700 Club today. They are unknown, unwanted, and unloved millions of orphan children worldwide living without parental care. 
Now, churches, Christian organizations, and hundreds of families in the Eastern European nation of Ukraine want to make a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable. To the human mind, it seems almost impossible. But spend time with the Isaiah family, and they'll soon convince you that with God, all things are possible. The moment you see an orphan's eyes, I promise it will change your life. Ten years ago, Svetlana lived with a dark past. Evgeny was a drug addict and HIV positive. Both had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ that changed their lives forever. I began to search for God. I could see the path that I needed to go on. The couple's dream? To see their nation of Ukraine without orphans. If someone told me 10 years ago I would have these many children and would be married to an HIV-positive man, I would say that's humanly impossible. But God birthed in us something special. Svetlana and Evgeny became the first family in Ukraine to adopt a child with HIV. Not just one, seven HIV-positive children. If we want to see a Ukraine without orphans, Christians have to be a part of the solution. And Christians are answering the call. Svetlana joined hundreds of pastors and Christian leaders from different parts of the globe in Kyiv recently for a summit on orphan care. Organizer Ruslan Maluta leads a grassroots movement committed to care for Ukraine's orphans. God said that he is the father of the fatherless, which means that he wants every orphan to be in a family. Uh, how is God going to do it? It's through the church. Adoption and providing a home for an orphan is an integral part of the gospel. And this is a crowd that is very serious about seeing a Ukraine without orphans sitting in the crowd. There are about 160 families that have either adopted a Ukrainian child or are today our foster parents. Gennady Munenko is one of them. He's a pastor, and along with his wife, they have 31 foster children. Should all families take 31 children in like we did? No. But if this movement is to have a lasting impact, Christian leaders must set the example, and they are. The last few years, God has been moving on the hearts of pastors to lead the charge. Paul Pennington is very encouraged by what he sees happening in Ukraine. The potential here is huge because the church is engaged across denominational lines to be a really a model to countries around the world how the church can make a difference for children. Pennington is with Hope for Orphans, a Texas group helping Ukrainian churches with Bible-based orphan ministries. Pennington has six children, five of whom are adopted. The only way to reach 140 million orphans around the world is through the church, because only the church is big enough, only the church has the power and the mandate to reach that many children in a sustained way. Pastors in Russia, Belarus, Romania, and Moldova have started similar Nation Without Orphans movements. What an honor to be in a room. West Stafford, president of Compassion International, says he's moved by the pastor's dedication to the vision. They do it with an understanding that God commits to bless orphans and those who do bless orphans. To see an audacious vision uh, that these guys actually are qualified to talk about because they're, they're doing it. Steve Weber calls the movement a miracle. Weber leads CBN's Ukraine office, which has an active Orphans Promise outreach. 20 years ago, uh, there was such a stigma against the orphan uh, that Christians would fake pregnancy by carrying a pillow before they would take an orphan. Today, we're preaching, take the orphans home in our churches. And the public is taking note. At a nationally televised event that drew Ukraine's rich and famous Svetlana and Yevgeny received hero status and honored with the Pride of the Nation Award for their heart for orphans. There was hardly a dry eye in the crowd as people stood and applauded. We didn't think about any awards. We simply were doing what was on our hearts to do. We have only God to thank. He shows us how to love the unlovable. Without Him, we have no life. Without Him, my children have no hope. Without him, the orphans of Ukraine have no hope. George Thomas, CBN News, Kyiv, Ukraine.
Up next, a devout Hindu seeks for answers to life and joy and finds her answer in a very unexpected place. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNnews.com. Now, this is Pat Robertson. This is an important time in the history of America. It's an important time in the history of CBN. And what you do is so very important now. But we've got to get the gospel out here in America. We've got to help the poor and the needy, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, bring medical attention to those who are suffering, and more than anything, bring hope to those who are without hope throughout the world. So your 700 Club membership makes a huge difference. And I ask you to go to your phone and call. If you haven't already called in, we appreciate what you've done so much. So don't slack. We don't want our hands to be empty. We want to say, Lord, here are those who have come to you because of my labors. Telephones are available, toll-free line, and we just thank God for each one of you. So don't hesitate to call and do it now. It was the most angelic, the most peaceful, safe, loving place. I wasn't afraid. There was not a feeling of time. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this sensation of being home. You just can't even imagine. The woman in our next story grew up in India. Though rejected by her father, she worked hard to get an education and become a successful social worker. When she had problems or needs, she sought help from the gods of her Hindu religion. Until one day, she heard a new voice telling her to go to church. When I was born, the astrologer told my father that it is not worth raising me as his daughter he said, it's better if you end her life now as a baby. It kind of poisoned his mind and thoughts towards me. Radha was raised in a devout Hindu family in India. She had a strained relationship with her father, one that worsened over time. Every business failure he endured or financial loss, he blamed it on me. He became an alcoholic and he abused us, you know, physically and uh, verbally. She sought comfort and acceptance in her family's faith. Every time I went to Hindu temples and worshiped gods and goddesses, there was peace. But when I came out of the temples, there was always a void. And that void was so strong. Hopelessness was always there. Radha turned to education in her search for purpose. She excelled in her studies. I did my master's in medical and psychiatric social work. And after I completed that, I was uh, given a job to work as a counselor in a cancer hospital. She provided care and comfort for many of the patients. However, this only deepened the emptiness she felt in her own life. People were suffering, you know, young and old. Some of them had asked me what would happen to their soul once they die. I didn't have any answers. I felt really desperate, so I kind of filled my void with more education. Rada received a scholarship to study in America, but life here seemed harder than ever. The culture shock was so great. I missed home my family, I couldn't concentrate much, and my grades started going down. She was on the verge of losing her scholarship, but she had a greater problem. I had only $36 in my account, and my social security card was stamped not authorized for work. It was impossible for Radha to pay for her own education, and she was unable to afford a plane ticket back to India. The fear of being homeless took over. You know, I was really afraid of the future, didn't know what would happen to me in this foreign land. It was a major crisis in my life. 
Radha sought help from the only source she knew. I cried out to all the Hindu gods and goddesses and asked them, which of you is a true living God? So I can just cry to one of you. I'm crying to all of you, not knowing who's hearing my prayers. I heard these are man-made images. I'm a holy God. Go to church, you will find me. I said, there is absolutely no way. That, that couldn't be true. I rejected the thought. But in my desperation, when the thought was so strong, I needed an answer. A fellow student invited her to church. I sat in the last seat and I started listening to them worshiping. There was such joy in my heart, I couldn't explain. There was peace in my heart. The pastor said that God wants to have a relationship with me. As a father-daughter relationship, all I have to do is just repent for my sins, invite Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was a pride-filled person. I said, there is no way I'm a sinner. I'm a good person, I'm a good social worker. I've helped hundreds of people in my life. She refused the pastor's invitation. Over the next few weeks, she wrestled with these thoughts. But one night, she had a vision. When I laid down and uh, trying to sleep, it was like a movie, all the things that are not right in the eyes of God. When I saw that, if these are wrong and sinful in the eyes of God, then I should ask for forgiveness. So I got on my knees by my bed and I said, God, I ask for your forgiveness. And uh, I don't know much about Jesus, but I invite him as my only Lord and Savior. The emptiness and loneliness started to disappear now I have this God, the personal God, that would walk with me, that would carry me through, that would guide me and counsel me and minister to me. So the fear was taken away from me. From then onwards, miracle after miracle after miracle happened in my life. She received a scholarship to another university, which extended her visa. She also moved into a Christian woman's home where she was mentored in a relationship with God. Radha's married now with a family of her own. She has full assurance that she found the true God she was looking for. Jesus gave me the sense of security and peace and joy and hope. When, when you really embrace God's love, then there is no fear and there is no loneliness, no more loneliness. His love surrounds you and He blesses you. Wherever you're in the world today, maybe you're watching this story. There are many stories like Radha's. You can find the link to them at our website, cbnnews.com. We'll be back right after this. Come on, Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there, providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBM partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? What if you knew heaven is real because you'd seen it? Everything's alive. Nothing's dead. Because you'd been there. There's more love than you can imagine. How would it change the way you live your life? He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Get the real story from people who've experienced life beyond the grave. Christian World News, your window to the global church for stories of revival. revival. Persecution of relatives and fellow Christians born in the first country over the International Day Line. I'm George Thomas in Baghdad and coming up on the broadcast an exclusive.
of interview. And the impact of Christian leaders. Watch Christian World News. In Mozambique, Africa, floodwaters have displaced nearly 200,000 people. In the middle of the suffering, the Christian relief agency Samaritan's Purse is giving people food, desperate food and water. So far, the ministry has provided more than 1.2 million liters of clean drinking water to some 10,000 families. And it's handed out more than 17 metric tons of food. Not only that, but it's helping prevent deadly diseases, building latrines and bathing shelters, as well as giving out more than 1,000 bars of soap. Finally, today, the African nation of Mali. The fight against Islamic militants is widening down, but CBN's Operation Blessing continues to feed and assist those caught up in the conflict. Gary Lane has more from Bamako, Mali. CBN News joined Operation Blessing in the capital city of Bamako as it fed a group of refugees. Most fled the Islamist takeover of the northern city of Gao. While they found temporary housing, they still depend on the generosity of others to help feed their children. Ali Matu Diara was pregnant when her family made the 600-mile journey from Gao to Bamako. Her baby was born with an abdominal hernia. Tiny Abdul Malik underwent surgery, but his condition has not improved. Operation Blessing asked this doctor to examine little Abdu. He says the first surgery wasn't done well. This baby has an infection and his intestine could come out again. Abdu's mom is now awaiting results from an ultrasound test, paid for by Operation Blessing. He may need another surgery. She told us, I am grateful to God and you for the high quality of beans and rice that you've provided. Also for your concern for my baby. Not only are refugees and victims of the war being fed and cared for, but CBN is doing what it can to help change the lives of young women. 19-year-old Fatima will soon graduate from the sewing school. She attends classes here because she wants a better future. She hopes to start her own sewing shop, and she wants to be a blessing to others. CBN helped Pastor Yurno Trori begin the sewing school in 2004. 14 young women started classes back then. Today, more than 120 students are enrolled here. They attend classes for three years. Pastor Trori says without job skills, many of these young women would turn to prostitution to support their families. Divorced women also receive training here. When a woman is divorced with three, four, five children and she can't earn her own life, that's misery. Some of these students are non-Christians. Trori often reads Bible verses to the women and teaches them about Christianity. We have received some who have become Christians and they follow the Lord. They want to go to church. So in a time of war, CBN is helping Malians meet some of their immediate needs, receive job training for the long term, and spiritual truth for eternity. Gary Lane, CBN News, Bamako, Mali. I hope you've enjoyed our show this week. Thank you so much for joining us. From all of us here at Christian World News in the studio and back in the control room, have a great week. Goodbye and God bless you.